good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karina Marcos. I am science officer and work in the COST. It's a European Cooperation in Science and Technology. So COST is uh, uh, organizing the session about advancing health care with the big data and machine learning. So what we'd like to uh, show to you here is some case studies and uh, discuss about challenges that are linked to these uh, two, let's say, uh, big uh, uh, fuzzy and, uh, well, words that everyone is using now, big data and machine learning, and how this could help advancing the healthcare uh, and what would be the barriers and the possibilities around this. So, first of all, I just wanted to uh, uh, quickly present COST. So this is one of the longest uh, European frameworks. So we found, we started our activities in 71. And it's an intergovernmental initiative funded by the European Commission. So we receive European money for our activities. And our main mission is to support cooperation among researchers, engineers, and scholars. And in fact, almost everyone is welcome in the different activities that we organize. Uh, the idea is really to uh, jointly uh, develop ideas and new initiatives among this uh, big community that is participating in the cost. Uh, what is important is across all fields in science and technology, including social science and humanities. So we'll have here some examples of uh, uh, ideas linked to, uh, of course, uh, health, big data, and machine learning. But uh, we have uh, uh, different uh, actions that we call in uh, social science, in political science, in energy, in the smart cities, in the quantum science, and so on. So I invite you to take a look at the COST website and that you see more about what we do. So what exactly is a cost action? Is uh, what we like to uh, uh, explain that it's an open space where ideas and people can grow without limits. So initially we have a group of people with the nice ideas and what they have is then the possibility to so submit a proposal and if they are selected, they have four years to develop their ideas within a community a budget for uh, these uh, uh, activities. And the activities that uh, we fund are mainly networking tools. So these are meetings, conference, training schools, a dissemination activity. So it's not really research itself, but all the different networking activities that help research and the results come true in order to have an uh, impact in the area, creating new ideas, uh, uh, expanding knowledge, training people to get to the same level, uh, promoting uh, multidisciplinarity and uh, a lot of uh, contacts and uh, even spin-offs in some cases. So what we are going to present here today is a, a session uh, involving four different sec actions. So we have uh, an action on uh, uh, so the neural arc uh, cons. So Christian is going to discuss about this and present. Then we have another one that will be presented by Ramek Gupta. Uh, Marcus Clausen is going to discuss about machine learning for microbiome. And then we have a Fernando Rivanedera that is going to present more about the action that's called Gemstone. So I'm not going to enter into details. Uh, each one of them are going to, is going to uh, present more about uh, their activities and uh, the challenges. And at the end, we'll have a very nice a session of uh, Q&A, so questions that you can submit already in the, the questions button that you see in your screen. Uh, and this uh, session will be moderated by uh, Ms. Naomi Lee that is uh, helping us uh, to uh, uh, organize this uh, nice session. So I hope that uh, you'll learn a lot and have lots of questions for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karina, for the introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Christian Lambert. I'm a neurologist and clinician scientist based at the Wellcome Center for Human Neuroimaging in UCL in London and the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. I'm here today as the slightly less glamorous understudy for Dr. Christian Sandberg, who is the uh, coordinator for our cost initiative, which is entitled The Neural Architecture of Consciousness. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us today, so hopefully I'm going to do as good a job of presenting uh, what we're up to. 
So by way of an introduction, we're going to start off with the question, well, what exactly is it we're, we're looking at? What is consciousness? So th this has been argued and debated over centuries, and there is no uh, simple or easy answer. But from a scientific perspective, what we're really referring to is some self or subjective experience that arises from some things. And these things may be external in nature, so they come from your senses in terms of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch or indeed your uh, internal autonomic system sensation of bodily function, or that inner monologue, that inner dialogue uh, or voice that accompanies you everywhere. And what we're trying to do is understand uh, the variability between people in terms of the conscious experience. Now, when you start thinking about that, it's a horribly complex problem with many, many degrees of freedom that can span and have contributions from many different biological scales, ranging from the cellular metabolic level all the way through to behavioral factors at population level uh, at the population level. Not only that, you can have contributions from your genome, your genetics and the environment. And to make matters worse, all of these levels can interact and modify one another. Uh, both uh, between genetic environment and each level of scale. So an impossible problem. We do have one advantage when we're thinking about behavior in the brain uh, in that we can study it and constrain this problem as we do in many areas of science by looking at the anatomy. And the nice thing about brain anatomy and the structure of the brain is that we can link it to measurable behavior and we can also link it down to cellular uh, structure and underlying processes. And by the time we get round to studying adults in a healthy adult population, most people have had their gene environment dosing. And in actual fact, it provides us with a very stable measure that we're able to measure non-invasively in adult individuals. And in some circumstances, it accounts for a significant amount of variability we see between certain things. And so we can detect changes in causal associations. We know about the brain that there are many different areas of the brain that subsume different functions. So you have a visual area at the back, an area for processing auditory stimuli and language. And not only does the location of the brain is important in terms of these, the size of these areas seem to have an impact in how you experience your conscious experience. And by way of an introduction, by way of an example, here we have uh, what's known as the Ebbinghaus illusion. And what I'd like all of you to do is just look at this center circle here and decide very quickly, and don't think about it too long, which one of these other circles here is the closest in size. So for example, for me, I look at it and I think A is probably about the same size as, as this one here. And whilst you make up your mind, I'll just explain the, the point of this is that there is uh, the size of your primary visual cortex seems to modify how strongly you experience this illusion. So in terms of the actual answer, the D is the same size as this central circle. And it goes anti-clockwise, going from actual size and gets progressively smaller. The larger your primary visual cortex, the larger the area in your brain for processing this visual information, the less strongly you experience this illusion. So those of you who chose C and D have a much bigger primary visual cortex than those of you who chose E and F. And this holds true, and the primary visual cortex, this area at the back that processes visual information, varies a lot between individuals and also between hemispheres. And we know it holds true not only for the Ebbinghaus illusion, but for other visual illusions, and it extends to other domains, such as uh, the area of the brain involved in memory, so the hippocampus, the size of certain regions will influence how well you can recall things compared to other people. So size matters when it comes to the brain. The, Objective with our initiative is to examine the role of this architecture of the brain, this cortical neural architecture, in, and its impact on, in, on consciousness from a basic science perspective as well as from a clinical perspective. The way we're trying to achieve this is to combine multiple measures to explain these individual differences exhaustively. But this poses a number of problems, which I suspect will get repeated uh, across different areas of uh, the other speakers in different areas of science. And these problems come back down to uh, comparing multiple things statistically, you know, there's a chance of getting false positives, and so you need in progressively increasing data uh, uh, sample sizes in order to do that. Then when you're getting into large data and big data, data quality becomes uh, paramount, and also the questions of how do you combine and analyze these complex data sets. 
And so the solution through our initiative is to try and recruit at least 200 participants, if not more. And then through the initiative that Dr. Sanderberg has set up with, uh, throughout the network is there's this interdisciplinary collaboration between neuroscientists, psychologists, doctors, physicists, engineers, geneticists, and experts in machine learning. So mathematicians and computer scientists. And they work in parts of the different groups. So I myself work in the more in the methods groups, but you have this very um, collaborative network feeding into one another in terms of the different problems. Already the network not only consists of centers around uh, Europe, but it's actually a, a global initiative with, con with collaborators all the way around the world working on different elements of the problem. In terms of what we're actually doing, uh, in terms of um, the, uh, the science, we've got multi-center recruitment and we're aiming to recruit over a thousand healthy individuals in the first instance. Each of these healthy individuals goes through over 10 hours of behavioral testing to provide this deep behavioral phenotyping cover, covering many different domains of the conscious experience, both your primary sensory modalities, including uh, other areas such as metacognition, your ability to self-reflect on problems, and other complex traits. They undergo one hour of MRI to provide something called quantitative MRI, where uh, each value of the, uh, within these images reflects something about the underlying brain structure, and of course, biosamples for genetics. In terms of what we're doing with the neuroimaging, so the anatomy of the brain, normally when people do these sorts of studies, they just focus on very basic imaging and basic structural processing. But through the expertise in the initiative, we are able to not only collect much more specialized types of MRI scans that tell us something about the underlying structure of the brain, but we were able to leverage these maps to measure areas of the brain and map areas of the brain you can't normally see and develop more complex measures in terms of structural connectivity, so how different areas are connected for using white matter and the underlying behavior of the brain, the functional connectivity. And this generates a multimodal, multimodal neuroectonic, neuroectonic map. And then using this complex multimodal map, we're able to not only link in this deep behavioral data we're collecting through the initiative, but then we're also, uh, it also provides us a way of linking in via genetics to other broad data initiatives, such as the UK Biobank. And then by combining all of these together, we can then start tackling and applying this data set to clinical problems, such as disorders of consciousness, such uh, i.e. coma, as well as the dementia syndromes and psychiatric conditions. And what, what types of clinical applications can we envisage or develop these for? Well, there's three main, uh, three broad areas, again, which I think will be repeated and reflected by other speakers. One is trying to predict future clinical trajectories. For example, in, in the brain world, predicting the outcome from coma or progression in dementia syndromes. This will allow clinicians, patients and families to make better informed decisions and also help with precision medicine, developing more targeted treatments. Then by linking the anatomy of consciousness to some of the uh, other biological substrates at different uh, biological scales using big data annotation, this can help us identify and narrow down potential treatments we can then take to the clinic and test. And then finally, understanding uh, many of the disorders of consciousness and thinking are complex, such as psychiatric conditions. And it's likely that these represent syndromes, so there are many different conditions under this big umbrella term, rather than single disease entities. And therefore, by mapping the anatomy, it will help us better identify these subgroups within these complex diseases. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd also like to acknowledge again Dr. Christian Sandberg, who was uh, the instigator and head of this initiative and really has driven it forwards, and all members of the Cost Action, uh, the Neural Architecture of Consciousness. And for more information, you can go to the website, Neural Arch Con, which has a much more up-to-date details, and as, uh, in addition to this, the SCOLDNET website. And I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karina, and thank you, Christian, for setting the stage here with this uh, really interesting uh, project, Thinking About Consciousness, uh, truly something where you'd, I guess, need the complex data opportunities uh, that big data offers. Uh, my name is Ramnik Gupta. I'm from the Technical University of Denmark, um, also working at Novo Nordisk uh, in Oxford. And uh, in this cost consortium legend, I'm chairing the databases and big data work package uh, just to introduce a few uh, few slides about Legend, this is a cost consortium 
working on pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This is a childhood cancer um, where the, the causes of death are very high uh, in children related to cancer. One of the things that we're very much interested in is understanding genetics that contributes towards the disease, but also towards treatment efficacy and toxicities to treatment. So um, up to half of the children who die from childhood leukemia uh, die because of the treatment. However, the cure rates are quite high, so we're doing very well. But uh, the goal very much today is to try to reduce toxicities and to see if we can improve treatment efficacy even higher going from the 85, 90% levels to, to much higher and to reduce relapses later in life. Um, the action facilitates really this cross-disciplinary um, collaboration because it's not just bringing genetics and biology together, but also clinicians and uh, ethicists together who work with patients uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the, the action here is chaired from the Netherlands uh, with Esme Wanders as the, as the chair. Uh, we're across several different countries in Europe, uh, uh, but just like the previous effort, the collaborations go beyond Europe into, um, into the US and into Asia as well. And part of the sort of uh, opportunity with big data or the requirement with big data as well is to, is to be able to pool data from multiple partners. And I'll raise that point towards the end as well. This is how we're divided in legend. These are the different working groups. Um, more importantly, perhaps I'd talk about the right-hand side of this is where we see the opportunity about mixing different types of data. So there's, we're going all the way from host genetics, uh, that's the predisposition to the leukemia, to tumor genetics. Uh, so understanding that the cancer that is developed in children as a result of the combination of host and tumor genetics. The clinical diagnosis and risk grouping when children come in uh, diagnosed and, and the environmental exposure. So what kind of immune system development have children had um, early in life, which may predispose them differently to the leukemia and may predispose them differently to how they respond to the treatment. The opportunity we have is as we get more and more of this data across different centers to be able to use methodologies to predict several things, understanding disease etiology, and then understanding treatment efficacy, how we might improve that, and uh, more immediately how to improve on toxicities to treatment, where we might, uh, if we can predict treatment toxicities early on, select different treatments or dial those, dial the treatments in a different way uh, during the two-year treatment protocols. Um, one of, just to give you an example of one machine learning application, this is a uh, slightly challenging area, but also fairly simplistic in the kind of data that we bring together. This is looking at white blood cell counts at the time of diagnosis. White blood cell counts is a, is a marker for treatment severity. So the higher the white blood cell count, the higher the severity of the leukemia that is um, uh, perceived at the time of diagnosis. And that affects the risk grouping of these children and also affects the treatment protocol that the children uh, go into. What we know today is that the white blood cell count is influenced uh, by age of children, by the immunophenotype and the karyotype, uh, which uh, we, we know from the tumor genetics. So we, this is the information we have. The question very much is, does host genetics also improve, also contribute to determining white blood cell count levels? So if we can understand what is uh, the native, what is the native white blood cell count of an individual and what is disease related, we'd perhaps be able to put them on the right treatment stratification. In addition, academically, we are very interested in what drives white blood cell counts at diagnosis. So there, there's two kind of goals of this, uh, of this project. Um, and just to sort of lay out the problem, um, the, pro the project is very much in early stages, uh, but this is what it looks like when you present, when you're at diagnosis, the white blood cell counts can range on the left-hand plot, you see the, the raw values, and on the right-hand side, you see them log normalized, and you can see really how much this varies across children uh, at diagnosis. So the, the goal is to try to understand this variation a bit better. 
um, if you look at the subgroups that uh, one would want to look at from a clinical perspective, you'd want to separate T cell leukemia, which is the top left plot, from B cell leukemia, which is the rest of the plots. Uh, these, these plots show uh, the white blood cell counts uh, along the age axis. And you can see really there is quite a very large variation. Uh, what uh, one of the students have tried to do is split a, fit a spline to this data. And in the B cell subgroups, which is the five plots, um, apart from the one on the top left, uh, try to see the different subgroups of B cell leukemia and how the distributions may differ. And then um, trying to see if one could adjust for the different distributions depending on, on karyotype and the subgrouping. So when we look at this, we say, uh, from a data perspective, these kind of subgroupings uh, can be made and have been made clinically, but clearly there's an opportunity here to combine variables in how one would want to predict the effects of that. And that's one of the early attempts in this is shown on the right hand side, where we have some machine learning that is trying to predict white blood cell count. And then this plot shows which features uh, seem to matter the most in predicting white blood cell count. So um, while there's, it's, it's clear that age will have an impact, there's also clear that there's several other features that play an impact in that prediction. And as we bring in the genetics in a more nuanced way into these models, we're hoping that we'd be able to get towards the individualized sort of white blood cell count signature uh, in, a, in a bit more precise manner. The um, data on the consortium, so one of the things that I said early on is that what makes this possible is pooling data across different uh, members of the consortium. Childhood cancer is a rare disease, so it occurs in less than five of 100,000 individuals. Uh, so uh, we need very large numbers uh, to be able to start finding the patterns in the data, especially as we try to combine genetics with their background of the children. So this, this is in this particular project, we'll be using Nordic data to build the models and then have the opportunity to validate this across consortiums in Italy, Spain and Germany. The um, opportunities really are that everyone has genetics and strong phenotyping on these children, which means that we'd be able to combine the parameters and have uh, reduced the, the amount of missing data that, that typically occurs in clinical machine le learning uh, problems. And at the same time, because of the precise phenotyping, uh, we'd be able to address a specific problem or at least have a clear understanding of what we're addressing where different countries maybe use the same cutoffs or if they use different protocols, then we have an understanding of, of the differences between the protocols. Um, final, finally, the point um, about data sharing requires the, the, the building of a data warehouse. So um, just to boil this down, this is the mission statement for the data warehouse strategy of legend. Um, and the key points of this is that we want to be able to have a strategy for shared compute so we can do joint analysis um, in a secure data platform that had the software available for the analysis and to be able to have a platform that was powerful enough to run various kinds of machine learning models and be able to combine data uh, you're looking at different combinations of data this requires a governance structure that would provide access to specified data sets to analysis teams and it, it requires certain sort of uh, components of, um, of the governance structure that provide comfort to the consortium members, such as the idea that data cannot be downloaded from the warehouse, but anyone can log in to make analysis on, on such a warehouse. Um, so these are the aspects that we're working on. And clearly after the action took off, uh, the GDPR legislation has come into effect uh, where different countries have chosen to implement it slightly differently, uh, but one could sort of, being in Denmark, uh, Denmark's taken perhaps one of the most conservative views on GDPR. So we have a high level of restrictions because of this, which um, on the face of it would prevent data pooling, but it's about working out the legal legislation to, to make pooling of data uh, possible. And uh, we believe we're quite far in that mission, but it also requires a greater awareness of the need for this and the challenge for it. Um, so the kind of warehouse we're building is uh, one that facilitates several projects where each project can have a different analysis team working on it or the same analysis team working on different projects. 
And each particular project, such as what you see in the WBC project, the white blood cell count project, will pool different data units from different partners into that project as required and as uh, allowed by the governance committee in the consortium. The analysis projects on the right hand side, you see a schematic of a team, which really brings this uh, multifunctional teams together. So you could get the data scientists close to the biologists and the clinicians, uh, which is really the way to drive effective um, machine learning in a clinical problem. Um, so this sort of, we're in the consortium now with several different machine learning uh, influenced projects. Uh, the easiest one to talk about is often the predisposition to leukemia. This is like GWAS and where we'd use other machine learning approaches on the genetics to combine, combine them to look at risk to leukemia in children. And then there's a host of other projects, white blood cell count I just discussed, along with the number of toxicity uh, problems that we're trying to address, as well as the continuum of mutations and variations from the inherited germline across the somatic, what's, what's in the tumor, and how that relates to the cancer and relates to treatment uh, efficacy and toxicity. And finally, just some thoughts on what the opportunities as we see it and challenges. I think the ability to integrate diverse data where we look at genetics in the context in which it operates provides a more powerful um, opportunity. This allows us to look at signals that drive subgroups and not just signals that are uh, diluted across the whole population, if you will. Um, it also brings together the consortium members that are necessary to be achieve the numbers uh, required to do this kind of analysis. Uh, this creates the challenges, but it also helps bring the consortium together and putting a, um, a cross-functional team together. And then working on GDPR uh, legislation locally that would allow different partners to pool their data in a central warehouse and allow them to conduct analysis. We've, um, we're monitoring the federated ways of doing machine learning, which means that people can keep data in their own servers and the methods would move to the servers. As far as we can tell, these methods are still uh, requiring further development. They've, they've come uh, some way, so it gives us hope that this will become feasible in some years. But the way they are today, I haven't seen uh, effective machine learning uh, sort of uh, implementations yet, but we're looking forward to, to that happening. And then I think some thoughts on the validation of such models. If we use large consortiums to put models together, we've kind of utilized most of the data, at least in one part of the planet in building the models. So we need other large data sources to be able to validate these. And, and then thoughts about implementing these models is a, is a dialogue that we're having continuously with clinicians in discussing how um, the clinical world uh, would move from the statistics that they're used to into a machine learning model, which to them appears like a black box, but it's not a black box. And that's part of the education both ways uh, that we're embarking on. So thanks very much and happy to take questions and uh, discuss in the end. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Marcus Clausen. I'm the uh, chair of the cost action called ML4 Microbiome, um, which uh, is with the other title, Statistical and Machine Learning Techniques in Human Microbiome Studies. So my own background is uh, in bioinformatics and microbiome research of uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, and I'm based in U University College Cork. And I want to give a big thanks to the ESOF organizers and to Karina for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our action here. So as with uh, many of these topics, it's, it's good to give a, um, it's good to give introdu um, a definition of, um, of what, what the microbiome actually is. And um, here, um, the definition of, of the microbiome would be the complete set of microbial genes and genomes in, in a particular uh, environment. And, uh, this usually uh, refers to uh, my, this refers to microbes, um, but we can then divide into uh, bacteria, viruses, or, or phages. So phages are 
are viruses that attack bacteria, uh, microbiome, you know, yeast and, and other small eukaryotes and so on. Generally speaking, uh, when we study the microbiome, we study um, the, the bacteria. So it's generally the, the bacterium we're talking about. In fact, um, the microbiome on, on uh, planet Earth actually takes up 60 to 90% of, of the total um, biomass. So it has an enormous uh, impact on, on uh, most functions on, on, on the planet. Um, and how do we study this? Well, traditionally, uh, it's generally done through culturing, so where you culture individual microbes and you grow them uh, in, in, in clones you, um, and you then study them. But this is only possible, uh, realistically possible, for less than 30% of all microbes. Um, but over the last 15 years, there's been um, uh, enormous progress in, in uh, better and, and faster and more paralyzed technologies such as next generation sequencing and in metagenomics. So here uh, this allows us to study the remaining 70% of the, of, of the microbes uh, on, on the planet uh, and with um, by, by bypassing the need to individually uh, culture the, the microbes. So instead here you, you sequence the DNA of, of a collection of, of bacteria uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, and this, of course, generates enormous amounts of, of data, which we need to deal with, which is the, the, one of the reasons we um, started this uh, cost action. Now, this, uh, the, the action is particularly, particularly uh, directed towards the human microbiome. And um, why is that important then? Well, uh, it actually uh, takes up quite a, it's, it's two to three kilograms in, in a, in a, in a in a lean man, uh, up to 38 trillion bacterial cells uh, the, um, in and on our body. Um, we have um, 1.3 bacterial cells for every human cells on our body. So we can say we are, we are nearly in a majority of, of microbes in a way. And uh, if we, the, the picture to the right here shows you just how varied the microbiome is in different uh, habitats on and in the hu human body. So you have uh, on the skin and in the, in the, in the mouth and the esophagus and in, the, in various parts of, of, of the intestines. So the large intestines have it's quite have a very different microbial profile from the from the small intestines and, and so on. And uh, the most of the research of the human microbiome has been done on, on the gut, which is where we have most of the data sets that we can work with. Uh, the function of, of the gut microbiome uh, is mainly to digest food. Uh, to synthesize uh, vitamins uh, and also to prevent uh, pathogens by just taking up space in, in, the, in the intestine and also to train the immune system. So it has many, uh, many important and crucial organism, uh, functions for, for us to, to, to remain in health. So, uh, so when, when that isn't uh, happening uh, as, as it should do, should do, we have a dysregulation of the microbiome or, or the imbalance. Um, that can lead to a number of different uh, health uh, disorders and diseases uh, and by knowing how this works and in order to change uh, to kind of change back uh, the microbiome to an initial healthy state uh, by learning more about that offers uh, offers enormous uh, number of new treatments and diagnostics and prognostics so you can also maybe predict uh, uh, how, how a disease course will, will, will happen uh, by, by looking at certain microbiome, uh, by a microbiome at certain time points. Uh, the microbiome is also important if you want to optimize um, nutritional composition in foods, and particularly functional foods, and how that is up, uh, taken up in the body. Uh, and also in terms of medication, um, and if, if drug companies are increasingly getting more and more interested in, in, in the microbiome because uh, people with a certain microbiome may, may metabolize uh, the, the drugs they take in a different way than other people with a different microbiome. Uh, it can also have an effect on of the safety and stability of, of the drugs. So it's definitely a lot of scope for, for research here. Now, why are we using machine learning for, for this? Well, in um, traditional, uh, for, not for traditional analysis, is based on statistical methods that have been, uh, been um, in place for a long time. Uh, and this is uh, based on very specific instructions where, where you have uh, uh, certain data um, and you, you then uh, carry out this statistical ana analysis according to, to these and you change some parameters and so on. So it's very important how you, how you program these uh, 
statistical uh, tools, uh, whereas with machine learning instead, it offers, uh, it, it turns it on its head, uh, the way we approach uh, analysis here. So rather than giving very precise instructions, we feed uh, powerful machine learning algorithms enormous amounts of, of data, in this case, uh, microbiome data. So this could be um, thousands of species, uh, microbial species, uh, in, in patients that are sick and, and uh, versus healthy controls and, and then the, or, or, or microbial genes uh, and then the, uh, a good well-designed machine learning algorithm will then find patterns uh, in these data and perhaps these patterns will be able to classify uh, which diseases, uh, which patients have uh, have a certain disease, or which are certain sub subgroups of disease, and, and so on, or maybe predict whether they're about to have a relapse or, or a clinical relapse. So, um, and, and in a way, in, for some machine learning algorithms, they, this may work as a black box that we don't really know exactly how it works. You know, what combinations of of, of uh, bacteria or, or the genes that are important to exist in order to classify a certain disease. Uh, these uh, black boxes are uh, sometimes, sometimes based on, sometimes based on neural networks and uh, which are mimic, mimicking the, our own human brains. Uh, more, more specifically, machine learning can div uh, is divided, uh, divided up into unsupervised and supervised uh, algorithms. So a supervised algorithm is when the data you feed the algorithm is labeled. So, so you know that, uh, so, so the microbiome data, um, you, you know what genes and, and species are there, but you also know where, where they come from. If they, you, you have them labeled either from sick or healthy people, let's say. Uh, and then the algorithm tries to maximize it uh, or discriminate between those two states, knowing uh, which samples are labeled and so on. Unsupervised don't have this labeling, so it's a bit more uh, blind in that sense. And, and to combine them uh, is, it can be quite powerful. Um, feature extraction is when you extract uh, features which could be in this context species or, or microbial genes uh, which are particularly uh, important for for certain uh, microbiome profiles and then we have uh, the after applying this algorithm you might be able to find grouping of objects or in a grouping of of um, uh, human subjects, for instance, into uh, subsets of this, uh, subgroups of disease or, or uh, that could be clinically relevant. Uh, we could also have predictive model uh, where you pre predict relapse and so on. Uh, these comes with a normal Hello there. Unfortunately, I think we've lost Marcus, um, but he'll uh, will endeavour to get him back, and we can hear the rest of his presentation. So, in the meantime, uh, Fernando Rivadinera from the Erasmus Centre Medical University in Rotterdam, could I ask you to uh, start your presentation, please? Thanks a lot, uh, Naomi. Um, I'm representing Genomics of Musculoskeletal Traits Translational Network. Uh, I am a professor in translational skeletal genomics, and uh, I'm wearing two hats, uh, so that from the genomics uh, discipline and also from the musculoskeletal part, since uh, my previous speakers have also done quite an emphasis on the implications of the phenotype, the disease, and the outcomes, I'm going to focus much more on 
what's relevant from the perspective of genomics and how our gemstone uh, action came to be. So I would like to begin from the emerging challenge of genomic medicine. And I think this is a beautiful slide presented by Eric Green uh, in Nature, where he shows uh, right after the human involvement ev of the Human Genome Project, what is expected uh, from genomics. And that's basically a phase of understanding, moving from uh, the understanding of the structure, the biology of the genomes, and gaining insight into the biology of disease. And that's what we are uh, currently facing. What we would like to move uh, forward uh, would be towards the advancement of medical science. And I think that's what's starting to be shown at the moment, but ultimately to come to improve the effectiveness of healthcare. But we are not there and probably we are behind in that timeline. And that comes because this translation from the genomic discoveries to the clinical setting have met um, some bottlenecks. And these bottlenecks begin with the complexity of what is being investigated. Basically, uh, biological processes are uh, in nature, by definition, uh, complex. And uh, despite the advancement in technologies, which have allowed to perform several assessments across the different levels of omic assessments, so building from the DNA, DNA and studying the genome and the epigenome, the RNA, uh, looking at the transcriptome, the proteins with the proteome, and ultimately to the metabolism through the metabolome, trying to understand uh, the processes that help uh, to explain how a phenotype comes into place. Specifically, and I think this also holds for other fields, but to our musculoskeletal field, we have had an extremely large yield of genomic discoveries, as for example, displayed by the uh, previously mentioned genome-wide association studies, where basically we are overwhelmed with the amount of discoveries that we have coming from the DNA. Um, when we move to the other assessments across the other omic layers, like the transcriptome, the proteome, and even the metabolome, we see that uh, the studies and the investigations has been scarce and sparse. And that comes uh, because they are not available with the tissue of interest that's uh, for the bone. And that has provided additional limitations within our field. Now, yet another problem comes how to analyze this multiple layer of omic and clinical data in order to be able to extract clinical significant information. And uh, this has uh, been proposed uh, already uh, for a while by the group from Mike uh, Snyder in Stanford that's basically producing the integrated uh, personalized uh, omics profiles. And that's putting all the information together in one individual from the different omic layers, the clinical uh, levels and the environmental interactions and be able to analyze them together, which is a non-trivial task. So the question remains, how can we achieve this? Now, the question is, do we need to do it? And my position would be that, yes, we cannot afford not modeling the complexity underlying these biologic and disease processes. Because when we look at only one of the dimensions, we are missing several types of interactions that are going to help to understand that phenotype. And this has been proposed uh, uh, by uh, Richie before, uh, where the best approach is a systems biology approach that can blend together the computational and mathematical modelings that can approximate what's happening at the complex biological systems. Now, this implies that a meta-dimensional analysis will be critical to get the full scope of the architecture of the biological processes that are explaining an, an outcome. And this means that we need to uh, take into account the intrinsic 
complexity. So it has been mentioned uh, before machine learning emerges as a promising tool to support uh, these system biology approaches. Again, it's not just feeding data and seeing what comes out. Uh, this needs a specific strategies to optimize that. And uh, this is one of the examples that uh, we have been uh, working uh, with the, our expertise. And this slide has been provided by Hena uh, Roschupkin in uh, Erasmus MC where basically you uh, create a modified neural network within a federated algorithm, how it was uh, previously uh, described uh, by uh, Marcus and uh, Ravnik, where you consider each of the different clusters of data in order to um, produce um, the algorithms. Uh, very important to this part is that you require big data uh, in order to obtain uh, solid results. So this brings us to the next question. How can we address this? First, the requirement for big data, and second, the needed expertise. And the answer comes uh, through collaboration. And that's how our gemstone, Genomics of Musculoskeletal Traits Translational Network, has emerged. So we were overwhelmed by the uh, enormous advances uh, through uh, whole genome sequencing, the existing GIGWAS that were growing, and the mega GIGWAS, uh, like the UK Biobank of uh, the Millions Veteran Program in the, the United States, that are actually huge studies, which are currently yielding an enormous amount of uh, leads about are areas of the genome that are related to a trait. But recalling uh, the diagram uh, from Eric Lander, we have to uh, think that we are only getting information about the map, but not about the function. And that's when we require to integrate the different types of inter in in expertise coming from the bioinformatics, the functional studies on the cell and tissue levels across the different omic layers, the integration of data from other organisms like the zebra fish and the mouse, and uh, the objective of bringing this to clinical translation using novel phenotypes like information about imaging, and as was mentioned, the implementation of machine learning approaches that will allow us to have an integration framework of all these big data. Now, uh, how did we organize this? We did it uh, basically on six working groups. One is trying to establish the uh, existence of the data sets that can be merged and the expertise from the groups. A uh, high uh, quality uh, set of expertise across the phenotype that meets and it's crucial for the interpretation of the findings. What we can learn uh, from the monogenic conditions that are not per se complex, but do provide some more solid evidence about gene implication, which is one of the downsides of the GWAS studies. And of course, the functional in investigations, which in uh, uh, integration across bioinformatics can really bring us to the translational outreach that will really change uh, clinical practice. Now, um, uh, what is the starting step? Uh, that will be uh, basically bringing big data together. Hmm? And that brings us to the aspect of setting your data free so that the scientific community can use it. Um, within the musculoskeletal fields, we have gotten our act together, also under the umbrella of Gemstone, partnering with the International Federation of Musculoskeletal Research Societies and creating a big data working group. And this is a strategic partnership between uh, these scientific societies uh, that are largely represented uh, from uh, all over the world, academics, industry, industry, and also patient organizations. And uh, the first outcome of this is putting together the musculoskeletal knowledge portal, uh, which is a big data platform 
that is meant to accelerate the translation of all these omic discoveries to the clinic in the musculoskeletal field. And you can uh, see by yourself uh, through the links uh, to this portal. But beyond being just a data repository of results, uh, what we aim towards the future is that the portal will also facilitate data analysis and scientific discoveries, um, making available analytical tools from this data. But then again, of course, this is uh, towards the future. So taking a glimpse into the future, uh, we come to the conclusion that big data is necessary uh, uh, once uh, you're going to uh, use, um, for example, the machine learning al algorithms. Uh, so how can we create this big data? And I think that's where a very important omic layer comes into account, that that's the econ omics. And that's how we are going to fund it. And recently, uh, some successful initiatives have emerged and from the genetics uh, per, uh, community, uh, we have the example of the direct consumer genetic testing market. And we see that this involves um, market value of, of, of uh, three billions hmm, that have been invested across, for example, nutrigenomic testing, targeted analysis, uh, clinics, hmm, uh, over-the-counter products uh, and online platform uh, segments like apps and devices, uh, which are related to health outcomes. Now, this means that there's a new generation startups that are really disrupting how we approximate healthcare, seizing a trillion dollar market in the process, hmm? and the type of products that uh, can be related uh, to it. So this brings us to a new concept, that's the concept of citizen science, and that's how I envision the, the future will be uh, for truly big data. And the objective would be to bring these companies uh, that are already having great investments um, to uh, bring the involvement of the citizen as a study participant, but also as an active uh, member of the research process starting by the design. Very important for the direct to consumer companies. Uh, this means that we would like to provide evidence based background, as we see that some of them have the clients, but not the evidence behind their products, so that these companies can really provide uh, this evidence based science in their philosophy, policies, and our products. And uh, the other aspect relies on genomics through another concept. I will not go in detail but it's basically optimized genomic phenotyping because genotyping has become so, so affordable that uh, for less uh, than 30 euros, you can have a genome-wide profile in genetics, which will allow you to um, basically assess many indications of a disease risk without actual measuring the measurement, like for example, lipid profiles, glucose profiles. These can, you can already have a, a, an, in, you can infer risk on the low and the uh, high risk uh, uh, segments uh, just by using genotyping. So the question again upfront is, can big data get any bigger? And Yes, uh, we think this is a model that we can do. We all have some app or watch uh, that's already collecting health information. It involves millions of participants, uh, which actually represent hundreds of thousands of unbiased health-related data points that could be subject to research. And very important, it will be citizen co-funded. And the study participant can be part of these research dynamics. One good example is uh, uh, an existing project that's the Micro Rosetta Initiative, uh, which is from Microbiome, yeah, which will take us back to Marcus in, in a second uh, to finalize his uh, presentation. And uh, it's a well-proven uh, citizen science uh, effort uh, that it's already ongoing uh, uh, under this philosophy. Uh, cost. And for those of you uh, in the audience who are members of COST, is uh, uh, co via the COST Academy, uh, 
having a citizen science webinar, which uh, you are uh, eligible to join on this topic. And uh, just setting uh, the, the discussion in the panel, I would like to finalize, of course, by saying uh, these cost actions are a very large number of experts in the fields working together and coordinated uh, through the different working groups, as uh, you see here. Um, the management and coordination of the activities, and of course, bringing several instances together. Um, you can get uh, more information from our website or email us uh, directly. Um, so I give back uh, the word back to the moderator. Thanks a lot for your attention. Great. Well, thank you all for the presentation so far. We had lost Marcus just midway through his presentation and great news that we have him back. So I'm going to hand you back to Marcus Clayson from the University College Cork uh, to finish his presentation. Thanks, Marcus. Okay. Um, ap apologize for the for the uh, interruption. Um, um, annoyingly, there was a, a broadband um, failure that uh, all the internet disappeared um, in the middle of, of the talk. Um, but um, anyway, I'm glad to be back and uh, hope to just f finish off on, on my presentation there. So I was talking about challenges with using microbiome data uh, with machine learning, and um, many times when you use machine learning you have lots of um, lots of uh, samples. Uh, for instance, if, if you want to use machine learning to uh, classify, uh, to find a cat, uh, that is a typical example, well, what, what is a cat from images on, on, on Google? You could have millions of pictures of cats. So, so that is a, a good way of, of use, um, that's a good type of input data because you have so many uh, samples in, in a way. And, um, uh, and not so many things to classify, it's just a cat. But if you have, uh, for microbiome, you usually have many more microbes or, or genes than what you have samples, because uh, it's relatively expensive to, to do microbiome studies per, per person. So, so that's uh, it's, uh, one of the challenges. Uh, and also it, it might be, it might be uh, very uh, quite possible to get a good uh, classifier or predictor based on machine learning for based on one study, one data set, but then to apply the very same algorithm for a completely different study uh, is also a challenge that, that generally seems to be have less accuracy than uh, on the previous study. So in order to uh, tackle this, uh, we set up uh, the ML4 microbiome with the main aim to first optimize and then standardize the best practice for machine learning techniques for human microbiome research. And how did we go, go about to achieve this? Um, we, we have uh, four different working groups, uh, where the first one uh, is, uh, has the mission to, um, to evaluate the state of the art of the, of the machine learning tools for microbiome and, and then pr provide uh, continuous updates led by uh, Jack True and Sanya Bredar. Uh, this is a so-called tech watch uh, uh, where we done evaluate methods and also we'll define priority areas for, for future M uh, machine learning microbiome research. Uh, and the second working group uh, is to establish uh, benchmark data sets that we can then use to test uh, the best uh, type of machine learning algorithms on. This, this is led by Leo Lahti in Blast Stress, um, where we first have to agree what di data types we, we want to use. There are many different types within this field. And uh, we then want to publish a benchmark repository for uh, people outside the cost action can also access to test uh, new methods. And, also, uh, and this is also part of a, we'll also uh, do the so-called dream challenge, which is a non-cost um, organization, uh, which offers, it's like a competition where um, other people around the globe can, can uh, compete in, in having the best uh, uh, machine learning, learning approach for, for a very defined set of uh, questions. The third uh, and one of the more challenging working groups would be to optimize and then standardize 
the, the actual uh, machine learning algorithms which have been evaluated in working group one uh, and to be doing that on the data sets in working group two. So this is led by Michelangelo Sessi and Sonia Tarazona. Um, and also if this works out well, we, we will investigate opportunities to automate the, the process. And all these three working groups will report and disseminate through the fourth working group uh, led by Dominica Delia and Alex Zomer, uh, which continuously dis disseminate the results from these working groups. And they also organize training courses for action members and people outside the action. They also maintain the websites and have a newsletter and, and other social media. So in terms of uh, where we are at the moment, we're um, nearly, we're one and a half years uh, of the four year project. Um, started in, uh, 20, in February, February 2019. Uh, we've done some of the working group one deadlines, uh, um, milestones, and uh, or working group two, and, and we're working away on some of the others. So, so uh, it's gone quite well so far. Uh, in terms of the, the size and structure, at, when we set out to do this uh, in early 2019, we were 24 countries, now we're 34. The number of participants have nearly doubled. Um, so there's been a lot of interest from all over Europe. In terms of inclusiveness, target countries. So these are countries that are uh, perhaps less research, uh, have less uh, research resources. And uh, one of the goals with the cost action is to promote the inclusion of these countries. So we have a majority of membership countries are from uh, these con uh, ITC countries. We have th increased up to nearly 39% females. Uh, um, is going in the right direction in terms of early career investigators. Uh, uh, we also want to have a high proportion of that because it's good for many networking and career reasons, uh, about 23%. And the, the, the structure is uh, as, as follows here. You have the Action Man uh, Management Committee, uh, where myself is a chair, we have Randy Bertelsen as a vice chair, and then we have the four different working groups, as mentioned uh, previously. Uh, we have the action training panel and the STSM, I'll tell you about that in a minute, uh, and science communication manager. They all work closely together with the grant holder manager uh, who, who is part-time uh, hired to do the, a lot of the administrative work uh, because it is plenty of that uh, into a core group and we meet regularly. Um, so a lot of this work uh, um, and networking happens through uh, to meetings. Uh, we've had a few so far. We've met in uh, the very first uh, MC meeting, it's management committee meeting was in Brussels in February 2019, uh, followed up by a working group meeting in Riga. Uh, and then we have a training school in Sarajevo, it was very popular. Uh, and then we had um, um, the MC meeting, um, last meeting of MC meeting in 2019 in Heraklion in Greece. Um, and due to uh, COVID, uh, our planned Barcelona meeting uh, had to be in Zoom. Uh, we had that in July earlier, uh, but it was still uh, quite uh, so, uh, successful. And in addition to this, we've also carried out seven so-called short-term specific missions. So this is where um, usually lab members of some of the of, of participants get to travel to the labs of other uh, members in, in, the, in the action and learn from, from them. Uh, and this is a great way to foster collaboration within the action and, and, and disseminate knowledge. We hope that uh, the pandemic, go if pandemic gods allows, uh, that we will have our next MC meeting in Sofia this December in a training school in Uppsala. Uh, if that wouldn't work out, I uh, think it'd have to be Zoom again. Uh, with that, I want to give you huge thanks to uh, grant holder manager Chloe Hussein, who's been instrumental with a lot of uh, administrative work around this. Uh, of course, the vice chairs, the previous one, David, and the current one, Randy, the whole core group, all the working group leaders and, and the other leaders. Uh, of course, all the MC members and the substitutes. And last but not least, our uh, scientific cost manager, Karina and, uh, and Olga. Um, and with that, uh, I leave you, I'm happy to take any questions. And I believe. On behalf of all of the audience, I'd like to give the presenters a huge thank you for some really interesting and compelling presentations. I've certainly learned a lot, not least that I've got a very small visual cortex. So I was totally fooled by the illusion, um, but also compliments to Karina and thanks for putting together this panel because it, it's, uh, it's a real achievement to 
get together such excellent speakers, but also that have represented the topic with such breadth and such interest. So Karina, thank you very much. Um, thanks to those of you in the audience that have sent questions and please do go ahead and send questions for the panel um, that I can put the panel on your behalf. Um, but I'm gonna kick off with one, which is first of all to Ramnik. So all of the panelists talked about big data. Fernando talked about very big data. Why is this label necessary and is it helpful? Could you give us some context on that? Yeah, I think there's been uh, several definitions of big data, but there's been at least a couple of these that people have put out, and that's the volume, uh, the velocity, uh, the veracity. Um, and some of these speak to, and the obvious one that people think about is volume, so thinking about large data, but it's not just that. And when we look at clinical data, especially with biological and some of the health challenges we're talking about, we're dealing with data that is uh, messy from a traditional data point of view. It's not collected uniformly across individuals. It's collected um, also when you look at longitudinal data, this is unstructured data. There's also a messiness in the recording of the data and, uh, and in getting the truth of that data, there's, there's challenges with that. These are aspects that contribute to the opportunities that big data offers. Uh, and and uh, I think I'd add to that the variety of data that we're seeing today. Uh, the costs have made it possible to really see very large volumes, but also a large variety of data characterizing um, individuals, correcting, characterizing biological systems. So quite often these methodologies look at uh, ways to bring different signals together. And when you see the strength across different data types, that's what drives, I think, the opportunity for new discovery. That's a little bit different from uh, some traditional statistics where you correct, you use one data type and you correct for one variable at a time. Here with the methods, we're bringing different data types together and allowing that complexity to play a role together and allowing the context of something to work. So if you're looking at genetics, you're looking at the context in which it operates or the context of that individual where that genetics will have a stronger signal. I think this is, um, what the big data field offers. So I think the label helps because it helps uh, recognizing that it's a different way of thinking of how we put data together. The opportunities with machine learning, as one of the speakers said, are working with less defined rules, but looking for pattern recognition across diverse sets of data. And that's what this is about. from my perspective. Okay, that's helpful. So we can understand big data as kind of bigger, less structured, messier. Um, so then I wanted to ask you, Christian, does that mean compared to traditional data that we might look at in medical studies that big data and machine learning are, could be uh, useful in different areas or is it is there still some overlap there? Um, well, I think there's two things there. I mean, the first of all, when you're looking at big data, you're really um, I, I increasingly find it helpful to think about what type of big data you're talking about. It's been given this label that's kind of emerged spontaneously and increasingly people are starting to splinter it off and talk about deep data where you're trying to very well characterize patient groups and get the detail in there versus broad data such as initiatives such as the biobank and others where you have millions of people but you don't have the the same number of measures and i think you need a combination of the two particularly in the clinic where you're actually at the end of the day dealing with individuals who have very unique problems and all of these you have to take you have to put it in the context of what you're trying to deal with clinically yeah, I, I would like to add, uh, Noami, to ask that, that part, uh, also some uh, uh, positive uh, uh, positions about the big data. And I think, for example, for the study of behavior, uh, you can also consider that this data that's collected not intentionally through a design that can be relatively unbiased, uh, just like uh, thinking about what uh, people will be looking or browsing on the internet and uh, uh, how these can describe about their behaviors, uh, for example. So this is a, a good example of how it can be unbiased and how close, much closer to reality. Well, it's really interesting that you mentioned that term, Fernando, bias and unbiased, um, and kind of closer to reality as opposed to trial data, which is maybe what we're more used to using in medical studies. So one of the audience asked a question, which is particularly around algorithmic bias. Um, so whether, you know, there are many sources of data that people talk about when we think about um, 
um, big data or machine learning. And that the question from the audience was saying, how can researchers handle issues of uncertainty in the use when they when these algorithms could be a black box? So perhaps you might like to address that question. And, and Marcus, it would be great to hear from you on this as well, because I think you you made some good comments on this. You mean me? Uh, no. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, uh, again, one would be uh, the advantage about the un unsupervised uh, approaches, because these will allow you not to have a pre-conceptual uh, setting of, uh, of what you are looking in the patterns. And uh, that's one way to say uh, this is uh, not uh, biased uh, by the knowledge or by the research question. Uh, Again, you have to see if this is uh, the fitting what the intention of the approach is looking for, especially in the medical field. Uh, do other panelists agree, Marcus? Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I know in terms of um, um, machine learning being a black box, neural networks and so on, uh, it is of course much more compelling if we know exactly how it works, if we, if we know what patterns, what, what, what's behind the patterns that can classify, predict a certain disease. But sometimes that's not possible uh, because, and, and, and the, the, the way the algorithms uh, work. But uh, even if it's not possible, it might still be very, have very clean, uh, powerful applications. If, if you're able to uh, make, in, in, in my field, the microbiome, for instance, a, uh, uh, an array or an assay or something that if you, if you if you show to have a small number of bacteria that to, in a certain combination we, will predict whether whether you are about to experience a, a relapse or something, uh, even if you don't know exactly how those bacteria work or what they're doing, it, it's still very useful. I, if I could just leap in there, I think it's less, I mean, if it's a tool that works, it works, it's great, but I think from clinical perspective, and as we're all going to be end users of this, it's more important to know where the tools are not going to work and where they fail, because that's where the interpretation is, and I, I think it's true, true of any medical test, um, is, is just being able to appreciate where the context is and how they can augment classic diagnostics. And I would add that the federated approach is uh, one way to do this because indeed uh, you cannot really lump all the information together and then expect that you're going to get the outcome uh, that you are expecting. So putting a level of control uh, depending on the type and the characteristics of the data uh, will also provide, uh, uh, well, a most likely aspect of uh, robustness in the outcome. Sorry to interrupt, Christian. So one of the things that I saw come through all of your presentations was the importance of collaboration. So one of the things that you all talked about was this interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think a couple of you said there's data scientists, there's clinicians. And, and Christian, do you think that this is one of the kind of keys to addressing this question? What's what's useful and where will it work? I think we all look at it in very different ways. We all have different uh, training styles. Um, and different languages and I think one of the things you get through these collaborative networks is you start to understand other people's perspectives in terms of how the data is going to be used and I think clinicians who are there the, the coal face in the clinic will have a very different perspective on what's an acceptable level of risk or what's an acceptable use of a tool than somebody say developing it from another uh, standpoint and I think you need that that crosstalk because um, ultimately you're going to need people to explain to to people who maybe are unfamiliar in this territory we have this test, we have this technique, how is it going to apply to you? How are we going to use it? And what does it actually mean? And can I ask Ramnik perhaps, do you, do you see challenges in the interdisciplinary requirements of big data and machine learning? I think the challenges, um, the communication challenge that we've seen between the data scientists and the biologists I feel is almost as wide a gap as between the biologists and the clinicians. So there are gaps across this spectrum and it's only the, you know, only bridging those gaps where we'll achieve something different than what we've done before. I don't think this is particular to machine learning, but it is a, um, to sort of get the acceptance of machine learning, that gap is particularly important to address. And it's partly because uh, there are certain ways in which the clinical world operates to change that requires a larger understanding of these methods and also understanding of what the strengths and weaknesses and limitations are so 
for a data scientist, I, I fully agree with uh, Christian's view, for a data scientist to throw data over the wall to a clinician, that has limited applicability because a data scientist on his own doesn't know what, how to tune a method, what is acceptable risk and in which direction to, to tune these methods for, for performance. Um, and for, from a clinical point of view, it's also important understanding what the data is saying and what it's not saying. And so that's why I think uh, these bridges are very important. Interesting. And uh, aside from interdisciplinary collaboration, many of you, when you were presenting, talked about the international nature of your collaboration. Um, Fernando, perhaps, do you think that there's something unique about that international collaboration which strengthens the work? Or it, could this be done within a country to the same effect? No, definitely. I think uh, science goes uh, beyond borders and uh, there are specific problems to specific regions, but at least on the study of disease, uh, you definitely need to go global. There are different approaches that are coming from different regions of the world. And I think uh, our experience with the cost action has uh, brought this up because we used to build up from an established network, already collaborative, but uh, we did not uh, think about other expertise that was out there that can also be brought here. There are also disadvantages. One of these uh, could be the different uh, regulatory affairs across regions, uh, for example, for uh, uh, bringing the data together. Yeah, it's really interesting that you bring that up. So uh, another question that we had submitted was about the challenges to sharing data. So one aspect of the challenges could be regulatory but another aspect of course is slightly more technical how is the data formatted what are the definitions used um marcus perhaps you could give us some comments on that yeah so you, you, you're right now it's uh, it's a big challenge with, with with these huge data sets and the way we approach it in our action is to set up google drive basically where, where we uh, share data and many times uh, things uh, the, 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 the data that we populate the Google Drive is also accessible through through publications and so on. But for, for us to make meaningful um, use of it, uh, we we still need to pre-process it. Uh, Peer-reviewed science has a tendency to you know in publications just provide the many times the bare minimum of of data that has to be uh, has to be uh, delivered. Um, uh, so so it is a lot of uh, many times to um, there have to be collaboration or at least conversation with the authors uh, that provide this in order to make me meaning out of it so, so other people can use it. And I hope that providing benchmark data sets uh, is, is important to, to so, so for future users to sidestep this. And this is one, one reason why these cost actions are important. Ramnit, you specifically mentioned GDPR when you were talking in your presentation. Yeah, I could just add to the, the interoperability of data, just the previous question, I think is also quite important. And some consortiums are beginning, beginning to think about it. I've seen the IMI consortium on obesity, Sophia, that has agreed to have all the consortiums work on a common format or submit the data and harmonize it to one format. But it's a very large effort. And uh, after data is generated to reharmonize it is very complex. I think it takes a lot of effort. So I think it's partly a comment about potentially for journals to think of playing a role in that space as well, where data is not, should not just be deposited somewhere, but think about standards when, when it's deposited to make them interoperable. Uh, the comment on GDPR is, um, I think it's a landscape that protects privacy, so it's an important uh, regulation, but it's also a set of principles that different countries have chosen to implement differently. Um, I see much more value in centralization of data being able to run more complex models across centralized data. Um, but there's also colleagues of mine who think that federated models would work. I think at least for the, even with federated models, there's a GDPR challenge in how the machine is seeing data across different countries. So I think there's a little bit of a gap from the principle of GDPR to the implementation, which would allow data sharing. Uh, and I think there's a lot of value to be gained from that and from the purposes of driving research forward, that's very much in the GDPR principles. So it just takes a couple of, uh, maybe we need a cost action with some legal PhDs to work out a course forward. We've, we've discussed a lot of the kind of 
the, the requirements around uh, big data and machine learning. So you need a lot of data, you need collaboration, there's bias. And um, looking forward, I'm really interested to find out from the panel, you know, how close you think we are. Did you all agree with Fernando's um, example of that we're still kind of at the end of this understanding phase, or do you think we're a bit closer? Um, Marcus, perhaps I'll put that question to you first. Yeah, um, it's it's a... Uh... I think it depends on the field a lot, um, and I'm, I realize I, I, I plug my own field here in the, the, the microbiome. Uh, this important uh, difference between, let's say, the, the human genome and the microbiome in the sense that we can't change our own genes, or we're not supposed to change our own genes, but we can change the, 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 the microbiome. And, and that has been an increasing realization from a lot of the industry now, which where it's been a bit of a boom over the last few years. Usually it was just an academic endeavor uh, but for the last few years, a lot of food pharma companies uh, have licensing li license technologies and collaborated with academia and other smaller companies. There's been a lot of spin outs around this as well in order to, to improve human health, food, uh, uh, medicines, uh, and put them into microbiome context. Um, in, in terms of uh, successful treatments and so on, uh, one that is, has been quite a lot in, in normal media is... Uh, um, uh, fecal microbiota transplantation. I realize we, we're, we're off the launch, so maybe I can talk about this. Uh, it's basically when, when you trans, trans, transfer feces from one from a, from a, don a healthy donor into a sick one, and uh, with people who have recurrent Clostridium difficile infections, there are over 90% success rates many times, uh, which medicines and antibiotics is not close of, of getting. And even though we don't know exactly what bugs do the job, uh, it seems to be like a consortia that, that, uh, of, of, of bacteria that, that do it. And then the next step is to maybe capitalize and find out what are the, can you make these things into pills and, and so on. So, so it's a lot of similar things that we're, we're, what the industry is working on. Uh, it also has to do with personalized, personalized nutrition and so on, where uh, microbiome profiles can help guide you what diet is most uh, successful for you. Okay, so that was a plug from Marcus that, uh, that we're closest on the microbiome. Do the other panelists agree? Um, I, I, think there's, I think there's some nice examples. I was trying to think in, in, in neurology terms or, or neurosciences, for examples. And actually, the, the one I came up with was um, really it was a nice example of where there was a very clear cut defined problem with lots and lots of big data and, and it's something that needs to be solved. And that's looking at the work in terms of deep mind and the more fields and looking at the scans of the back of the eyes. And the reason being is you, you have this technique called OCT, which scans the back of your eyes. And it used to be just in hospitals and then increasingly opticians got it and you could go down and get it in your high street, which suddenly exploded the volume of data. Um, and a lot of these scans, there were indeterminate. We weren't sure what to do with it, but we never had enough um, ophthalmologists to really review the data. And so having this very clearly constrained problem that they needed a way of triaging this mass of data and this technique that married very up, married up very nicely in that we're not interested in 80% of this, we need to identify the 20% where we're concerned, it was a beautiful example of where this could be focused on a very targeted, discrete problem and provide very useful results. And I imagine moving forward, we're going to see more examples like that as we, as we sort of develop this, these techniques. Very interesting, yes. Uh, Ramnik, have you... Yeah, well, you know, I thought this was an example of operationalizing sort of a... Um, set of rules that you'd look at. And, and this is what image recognition is doing today a little bit with the, also looking at retinopathy and um, a couple of other image recognition algorithms. I think this has acceptance um, because it's easy to explain what is, what's being done. You know, you're looking at an image and converting, processing that computationally instead of what you would see with the human eye. And, and these, these kind of patterns are easy to translate into in one's understanding of what a computer method would do. But when you start thinking about inclusion of genetics, which is a little bit of a hidden kind of data that a clinician doesn't see when a patient arrives, uh, this together with things like socioeconomic background, and then mixing that up, that up with clinical diagnosis, I think that presents a new ch challenge in how we, we kind of see the output of these models and how we'd want to implement them. So we did a case with testicular cancer toxicities where we could predict to very high accuracy which patients are likely to develop uh, nephrotoxicity 10 years later. Uh, does that mean we would now change how we would dose patients? 
not yet. There isn't really the willingness to do that yet, but there's a curious eye on where these methods are taking us. And I think, so it's about getting to the next stage. So I kind of agree that we're at the stage of understanding from our perspective, at least. Great, Fernando, what, what do you think on this? Yeah, back to me. So I, I am more behind the strategy of under promise and over deliver. And probably that explains uh, a little bit of my position. I think indeed uh, there are uh, some very good examples of how we have uh, reached that point in the perspective that uh, uh, health and uh, medicine are starting to be changed uh, by the technologies uh, in general. Um, in genomics, we do have very good examples from monogenic conditions uh, where we see. Uh, I think uh, one of the most recent successes is uh, finding the first promising uh, treatment for achondroplasia, uh, which has been a disease that has been studied for many decades now, and many similar examples. I think it's much more difficult in the complex uh, diseases uh, where you have the multifactorial component between the gene and the environment interactions. Indeed, we are looking for the environment uh, uh, that can be changed, and that's how epigenomic and microbiome research will provide some leads in that direction. On the genetics part is where we need much more work, and that's where I think modeling the complexity is going to be a crucial step. And you're going to require the two aspects we have been discussing all afternoon. That's big data and new ways to analyze it where machine learning uprises as a feasible approach. Wonderful. We're so nearly out of time, uh, but there's one really quick fire question that I want to ask you all, which is we've talked a lot here about how cost facilitated interdisciplinary information sharing, how it's facilitated data sharing, uh, um, validation of models that have been developed. But what about the networking uh, facilities of cost and how uh, we've been brought together today for the panel? So I'll quickly go around and can you just say a few words or you know one or two words on um the the benefits you've had from this so ramnik uh one clear benefit is being able to pull data across different consortium members haven't had that before but the second is being able to bring different perspective from treatment across different countries where the considerations are different and that one doesn't normally get exposed to so that's been very beneficial brilliant marcus uh, i think it's been transformatory for for um for networking, uh, even though things like to realize that other people are working on the same thing or, or similar things and, and you can uh, benefit from collaborating rather than competing. Uh, and, and and also realization that, that you know, the, the goal and the mindset and many times the methods are, are, are more or less the same. You can just tweak certain things and then um, benefit from, from that. So I think it's been very good. Great, thank you. Fernando. Yeah, uh, multidisciplinary approaches are definitely the way forward. And I think that's uh, the cost philosophy. Uh, Ramnik actually had a very good suggestion of one of the problems that needs relates to the GDPR and how the GDPR can actually block the advancement of science and how bringing together uh, scientists, uh, policymakers, and uh, experts in law, uh, it's a very good example we should pursue. Thank you. Christian, just a couple of words. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, I'd echo what everyone else has said. It's the chance to meet collaborators, share ideas, ch change perspectives and indeed meet and make new friends. I, it's a fantastic initiative. Great. Well, thank you all. It's been a fantastic way to spend a Friday afternoon. So I'll just thank you once again for such an interesting discussion. And I'll pass back to Karina, who I'm sure will also add her words of thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much, Naomi. I think it, we got a very nice and interesting questions. I hope that the audience could uh, benefit from uh, all the knowledge that was uh, put on the table here. Uh, also, I think that it was a very good example of uh, multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity and uh, cooperation, uh, not only now, well, in each one of the actions, but as a, a common effort to put this uh, session together. Uh, I just have uh, had a, 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 a thought during the, uh, the the discussions here is that well we have read uh, at some point that well the the guts are a second brain so maybe we can have a, a, a joint action between uh, uh, Christian and uh, 
Marcus in order to work on this and see uh, if we have some uh, interference uh, from the guts in the conscience. So uh, that could be a, maybe another cost action for a future. So I just encourage you uh, to continue with uh, this uh, collaboration and I uh, also would encourage the audience uh, to uh, get in contact if you want to know more about this uh, on the different uh, uh, cost actions in the cost.eu website. Uh, knowing that uh, most of the cost actions, they are open, so you can still join if you want to collaborate and to know more about them. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your energy on this. And uh, thanks once again only for this uh, wonderful moderation. Thank you very much.